So we're going to continue our theme of the creatures of the great outdoors. And um, I'm going to do something quite serious actually, so we're going to chat about ticks and live disease. Thank you. Uh, thank you much, Corey. Um, so this is obviously part two of the outdoor bugs and germs thing, and uh, my particular personal interest is the whole business about ticks in our ecosystem. So, um, what I'm going to do this, this afternoon is try and, um, well, first of all, the most important point is I've got a number of patient photographs here, and I'm very keen on patient driven ed education. So, Alan's presentation this morning on strokes and so on I thought was absolutely brilliant, and we need more of that sort of stuff about patients actually driving medical and first aid packages for patients. So I just really want to give a public thanks to the people who allowed me to take photographs and then uh, give me their written consent to using their photographs in presentations like this. Uh, what I hope to do is to get you to understand about ticks in our ecosystem, how they're changing, and really that to be a guide uh, as regards education and prevention in our communities. Um, I want to help you deliver a confident and consistent message about tick removal as our most important uh, prevention exercise. Um, I want you to be able to understand the rash, erythema migraines, um, and later symptoms that you can then convey to people so that they can seek medical advice for treatment. Um, I'll make a couple of suggestions about training for tick removal, um, and really hopefully I'm trying to get over the idea that if we get this right now, we can present, prevent an awful lot of other things occurring uh, in the future. So just going back to the basics about this uh, condition called Lyme disease. Why is it called Lyme disease? <coughs> well, it was first described in 1975, um, that's the year I graduated from medicine, um, with an outbreak of um, arthritis in children uh, in old Lyme, Connecticut, in good old USA. Um, and what was found then, that there was an outbreak of uh, joint problems uh, in children, and um, a very clever public health doctor at the time um, managed to map all the cases uh, and realised that they were due to ticks. And what happens is that the ticks uh, carry a bacteria, <coughs> um, which is a spirochete. So when you look at it, it's very difficult to look at under, under the microscope. You can't really effectively look at it under, under a, an ordinary microscope. Um, but it's got, it's got like a corkscrew type shape. And it's very similar um, to the organism which causes syphilis which is equally difficult uh, to treat and has an affinity for the central nervous system. Essentially, uh, what uh, Lyme disease is all about is really the animal um, transferring, uh, so the animal's got the tick on it, and then uh, the ticks can't fly, but uh, if, the, if the tick is, is, is hanging around on the, the bracket or the grass there, then it alights upon the human. And uh, the tick uh, is present uh, in virtually all ground level mammals and birds. So it's not just about deer. Deer are very important, but it's not just about them. And uh, the affected vectors uh, are therefore things like voles, deer, rabbit, um, grouse, for instance, and actually hotching. Now, in terms of understanding the, the life cycle of the tick, this is actually now, there have been a number of research studies done in Scotland and elsewhere about, well, how many ticks actually carry um, the bacteria. Um, and this is um, a journal taken from the Scottish Journal, <clears throat> where what they do is you kind of go through forests and so on, you do this dragging business, uh, and then analyze the number of ticks um, with the, who, who carry the bacteria. The problem with this work is that it shows that there's actually quite a variable, dis variable difference. So this white spot here, uh, a very low number of, of ticks have got the, the breeder in it, in the white spot, but in the black spot here, just a, you know, a very short distance apart, um, there are 13.9% of ticks. So the main message for this is, is that it changes within a year and it changes between locations. Um, and it's all a bit uh, difficult and unpredictable. So really what we're aiming for um, is a generational cha change in understanding on tick removal. And you are the frontline experts. And the reason that we've got this uh, tick card thing uh, sitting on your desk, on your, your chairs, uh, is to help you uh, start this whole process. So, the other thing to say is that all ages are at risk of ticks, uh, and it's all about us entering their ecosystem. And the traditional methods of tick removal, which I'm sure you'll hear about when you're running uh, first aid courses and people tell you how they remove ticks, is they'll talk about fingernails, Vaseline, cigarettes, domestic tweezers, all these sort of things. 
The problem with all these things is that they risk squeezing the body of the tick and encouraging the disease transmission because the bacteria is carried in the stomach of the tick. So if you squeeze the tick, all you're doing is squirting uh, the bacteria into you. So a lot of public confusion about tweezers. Now, um, I see on the line of the stand out there that they're, um, which is a UK charity, um, are promoting tweezers. And Public Health England is slightly guilty for this. They've gone down on a, off a tangent saying it's okay to use fine-pointed tweezers. Actually, what happens in real life with patients that I speak to, if you say to patients it's okay to use tweezers, they use the domestic tweezers of the eyebrows and so on. And I've got this long-running battle with Health Protection Scotland, a number of people sort of saying, look, this is crazy, stop telling tweezers, it's causing, causing harm, but I can't do anything to listen to me. Um, <coughs> Um, the main thing on tick removal, the best method of tick removal is to use either the twister sort that's being advocated um, by our side, um, where you get underneath the twig, tw twig, underneath the tick, <laughs> you twist and lift it off. Um, and or well, the other method is the card method that's, that we've just distributed, where you're kind of getting underneath and you're kind of like flicking it off. And the problem with ticks is that they go into all sorts, they go into the hot, moist areas of the body where you wouldn't necessarily think. So it tends to be behind the knee, uh, on the, um, in the armpits, in, in the folds of fat on the abdomen, uh, in the armpits, uh, in between the toes, um, and certainly in the hairline, behind the ears and back of the neck, particularly in children. So the problem with this is, is that people aren't necessarily going to be able to even to actually see the tick. So, um, one of the things is that I like to encourage people to do, and the key message I want to get over to you in first aid training, is encourage people to do the whole tick buddy thing. So in other words, you come back from your hill walk, you come back from working in the forestry, um, it's okay and sanctioned by training that, um, please can you look behind my knee, please can you look at my back, please can you give me a check. So in the same way that you remember the David Attenborough films of sort of uh, baboons grooming each other and looking for fleas and all that sort of stuff, we need that in the Scottish population, please. So, uh, we want tick bunnies. What we're trying to do is intervene with the disease transmission process, because what happens is the tick latches on, it then injects an anticoagulant into you, um, because it's trying to suck blood back. And that whole process of latching on to you, injecting an anticoagulant, getting your blood back, takes between 12 and 24 hours. So the sooner we can get the tick off, the better. No, twisters and cards. Um, I don't mind which, but certainly not fingernails and certainly not tweezers. Um, we need them in first aid kits, so we want them in rucksacks, uh, we want them in people's homes, we want them in work, works vans, uh, we want them in the B&Bs. Those of you who are doing first aid training to the B&B ladies of the north of Scotland or wherever, uh, we want them in their first aid kits and we want, want them to know about this sort of stuff. Uh, advise and teach both options, both twisters and cards, because both, uh, both are useful. Where can you get them? You can buy them online, you can get them from the Lyme Disease Charity online. Uh, you can get them from farm shops, uh, things like you know, Highland Industrial Supplies, um, these sorts of places in the Highlands. Uh, there's a bit of a problem with pharmacies. Uh, this is a problem which has bedeviled me for um, several years now. Trying to get them into Boots and Lloyds, all sorts of complicated stuff about animal products and, and central buying policies and all the rest of it. Um, but we have a ludicrous situation up until just a couple of weeks ago, I got an email about this. We have a ludicrous, ludicrous situation that people travel, uh, we get thousands of visitors walking from Milgai uh, up to Port William on the West Highland Way and in the boots in, in Milgai, I've been on several occasions where are your tick twisters and cards, they haven't got them. Go to boots in the High Street in Port William, where are your tick twisters and cards, they haven't got them can't get them in a central buying policy. So independent pharmacies uh, will probably have them, but the big multiples were still uh, fighting that battle. Uh, they cost about a fiver if you're buying them um, off the internet. Um, can you reuse them? Um, what do I do? Yes, I do. You just got to wash them or boil them or sterilize them or something or other, but yes, you can use them, reuse them after cleaning. Um, what we're trying to achieve, well, the outcome measure in first aid terms, is a live tick after you've got the thing off, because we're not wanting the disease transmission to occur, um, i.e. you've not squashed it. <coughs> Try to get it by whatever method you can, uh, within 12 to 24 hours. So, therefore, in real life, uh, if somebody says, well, I, might, I haven't got a tick card, I've just got this tick, I'm away this camping holiday, what should I do? Yes, okay, your fingernails are better than that. 
the nothing or domestic trees as a better than nothing or the domestic or the trees as in your Swiss army knife or whatever. Yes, okay. Stop the disease transmission, but the, the, the perfection is uh, is doing it properly with a card or a twister. And we're eating for clean lift off. Um, the other thing is that people often ask you about very tick heads, what on earth do I do about that? You just leave them alone. Uh, they don't carry the disease, the actual tick head uh, is left, you can just leave it in, it will eventually come to the top of the surface of the skin uh, and this is a worry that people get a little bit animated by very tick heads. In terms of occupational health uh, groups and so on, who should be worrying about those who have been teaching industrial first aid? Uh, forestry groups obviously in particular, so people working in the forestry industry will tell you that uh, in the summer months they will come home and will sometimes have as many as sort of 50 or 60 ticks on their bodies all over them. Um, the Forestry Commission have introduced um, uh, pesticide impregnated trousers recently and think that they're actually reducing the tick numbers, but they are a problem for forestry. People work in grouse moors, as I say, grouse are hotching with ticks. Anybody working in sort of the general outdoor stuff, farming, fencing, but also some things that you wouldn't normally think about. So people working on the rail track on the West Highland Line, uh, encountering, encountering shrubbery uh, beside the rail track. Uh, people working in the general outdoor industry, so ecologists going and doing ecological surveys for wind farms, that sort of thing. People working for SNH, park rangers, anybody working in the outdoor education industry. And, and again, another branch um, that you probably wouldn't think about is the police. Um, so special branch surveillance officers who are um, digging themselves in in the undergrowth to sleep out in a big or something like that um, can be at risk of picking up ticks. Um, when they're doing undergrowth searches uh, for um, forensic reasons, um, wildlife crime officers, dog handlers. So uh, that's another occupational group if you're doing occupational health training to the police. Um, it's important to mention this. And, and I'm pleased to say, due to some stuff that I've done in the background, um, Police Scotland have recently done a big search program about this sort of stuff, so the, the, the message is beginning to get through. The key thing about all these people is I see, like you, I see these as the professional leaders and role models in their communities on tick removal. So I think if you guys get this right, you'll spread that down to the role models and next, which are first aiders in, in companies or whatever, and then the, the message will then start getting through. So that's why I think you're such an important group to understand all this stuff. Um, as I say, the tick goes behind the knees, so just to emphasize the point, so um, I'm personally not worried about ticks, so this is my knee. Um, last year, having been while swimming up Glen Nettiff, so I was swimming in the river uh, and I picked up a tick, so I've done the two bad things that I've been telling you not to do, um, but no big deal. But the interesting thing about this was that um, I, I went to bed uh, not aware that I had a tick, but it was only the next morning in the shower and I said to my wife, oh, there's something funny behind my knee, and she looked at it in a big eek. Um, so uh, what I did was that um, I said, no, no, leave it there. Um, so I went down to the practice and then dropped my trousers in front of the practice nurse and we got this picture. So, uh, <clears throat> so it may not be visible to the patient and the tick may not declare itself. I'm not sure what I'm to say. So children, because of just the fact they're small and they're kind of running through undergrowth and stuff like that, um, this is obviously a child's eye. I don't know if you can see that in the picture. There's a tick on, the ticks, a tick on this child's eye. Um, and uh, this is a problem in rural areas. Um, and this particular tick, this wee boy was taken down to the practice and I used a, a twister to get this tick off and perfectly okay to take it off. But again, you can't leave it there because you're going to risk, you know, risk disease transmission and all that sort of stuff. Uh, another point about children. So this is a wee boy in my practice uh, last year. Um, he's, I can't remember what age he was, he was four. Um, and he had a tick behind his ear. I don't, you can't quite see it with the way the thing's projecting, but where the spot is is where the tick is. Uh, the reason why this is important is because if you look at the anatomy of the face, uh, this is the facial nerve. So Alan this morning was talking about facial paralysis and stuff like that. Um, the post auricular behind the ear branch of the facial nerve is there. So if that's where the tick is, you've got a one-way ticket. Uh, for getting the breeder, if it is infected, tick into the facial nerve and then causing Bell's palsy in the face of the child. Um, so, and you might not, because it, because the ticks tend to go in the hairline and in places where you would not be thick behind the ear, that's why we've got to raise awareness on this sort of stuff. 
Um, this is uh, one of my grandsons. Um, so this is a friendly deer who looks very cute in our back garden in Fort William. Um, my daughter was up. Um, he was out playing in the grass in our house. Um, comes in, eek. Dad, um, there's a tick on, on Ted, so I take it off. And this is my outcome measure. Uh, this is a live tick. I was able to reassure my daughter and say, um, I'm sure this is okay, but it's certainly at the larva stage, and probably it's going to be fine. But the reason that we probably got ticks, and I think the change in the ecosystem, is normally we didn't, we didn't used to get ticks in the garden. Uh, my children, I've got four children, they never had ticks in our garden. My grandchildren are now getting ticks in the garden. So simple observatory science, um, something is happening. Now you are allowed uh, a bit of a allowable uh, local reaction. Um, this is the whole business about the tick saliva, which contains the anticoagulant. And this is a patient of mine who very kindly collected these serial um, pictures for me, because some people seem to develop a bit of reaction to the saliva, and will get this little allowable reaction, which, which, which disappears after day three. Not everybody gets that, but some people do. <coughs> However, um, if the rash spreads into this, these classical target type things, um, that's what erythema migrans looks like, and that's the early treatable stage of Lyme disease. So um, the answer to this is yes and no. I, I'm a bit worried about people getting a bit obsessed with targets and targets and what it looks like, because it's not always like targets, as I'll show you in a second. But when you Google pictures of Lyme or what does Lyme disease look like, the images you'll get back are not necessarily these ones, pictures from the States, where this is one from Canada, which I got courtesy of my daughter who's out there at the moment. Um, so this is a Canadian erythema migrant, and as you see, it does look like a, tar it does look like a target. Um, but uh, what does it look like in Fort William? This is a real live patient from, who was just gardening in Corfuck in Fort William, and as you see, it's just this, it's not, it doesn't look like a target, um, it's just a big rash with a central bit. I'm sorry that the slides are looking a bit wishy-washy from where I'm standing, so goodness knows what they look like at the back of the room. Might be an idea, thanks for coming. Um, so, um, another one. Um, this is the manse in Port William, the, the minister's wife. Um, he gave me permission to this photo now. Um, and this, all, all that the, 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 uh, <coughs> the minister's wife was doing was hanging out and washing on the back road, on the back line in the garden. And uh, she got bitten by a tick. Um, the husband, who previously had the, the, the target type thing before, thought, oh, there's no problem because it's not a target. And it wasn't until um, seven weeks later that this then came out and went completely away uh, with the. Uh, antibiotics. So the point I'm making is that it's not all about targets. Yes, this is this is this is an example. The two previous slides are examples of Lyme disease. So this is where the Borrelia bacteria has been transmitted to the human and is now in the skin. And this is the effect. This thing here is the effect of the Borrelia bacteria. So it's a contaminated tick that that person's got. So that's a good question, thank you. And the other thing that we have to be aware about um, is, I've been mentioning this morning about people on uh, the modern methods of uh, treatment of various diseases uh, and immune suppression. This was a lady I saw last summer um, who was on holiday up here and probably would have gone back to see the doctor where they wouldn't have known what they were looking for. She'd been bitten by a tick. She was also on methotrexate, which is a drug which is used for treating a number of medical conditions. Um, and again, it's not a bit difficult to see with the, with the slide, but there's a rash all the way around there. So she had uh, responded to um, the treatment. The other thing in terms of at-risk groups, um, this is a, a lovely old chap, who's a patient of mine, 87, and he's got a cat called Loki. Uh, this is Loki, and the cat's ecosystem, his name is Loki, and no Loki is the, uh, of course, the Norse um, trickster god. And Loki likes to sit um, on one of Jack's knee. And uh, Loki's ecosystem is this sort of stuff behind the flats. Um, Jack uh, used to be a very key hill man, but it's now fairly restricted to the house. Um, and the disease expression that you'll see in the older, frail, elderly skin it looks somewhat different 
But again, to the classical pictures that you'll see off the internet. So pet transfer, so in other words, the tick got a free ride into the house on Loki, um, sitting on Jack's, Jack's lab, um, tick, uh, and then the erythema migrans. What else can it be? Um, this is uh, a colleague in Fort William um, who was bitten by, a, he's a health professional, um, bitten by tick. Um, his doctor originally thought that it was maybe correctly, um, either shingles or a fungal reaction. There was no clear history of tick bite, but certainly tick exposure. Um, seven, uh, and big, quite a time interval later, um, this is the rash expanded and his Lyme disease test was positive. Uh, what else could it be? Um, these are flea bites on a child, so fleas, fleas are quite common these days. And bits of fluff stuck in, 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 in uh, flea bites. So um, at a first aid level, somebody might think, oh my goodness, there's a tick there. In fact, it's a, it's a bit of fluff in a flea bite. What else could it be? Um, clegg bites, uh, whether you call them clegg bites or horsefly or whatever, this is uh, from a colleague of mine. Um, the difference is that in clegg bites, um, horsefly bites, you get a, an instantaneous reaction. They're going to be at a higher level. They're either going to be on the arms or, or the top of the legs when you're wearing shorts, etc. You're going to get a fairly instantaneous pain-type reaction and a fairly instantaneous um, spreading of a redness, and it's basically going to be a flying insect. But you know, that's one of the things in first aid, first aid level. Um, there's no treatment required for a, a horsefly bite uh, normally. The other difficulty is that the rash changes. So this is a gun, this, it starts becoming fairly faded and unimpressive. This is on the side of somebody's knee. So one of the things that I want you to do at a first aid level is encourage people to catch, um, capture pictures of their rashes on their mobile phones because they do disappear. So if they're going to wait a few, you know, a couple of days or whatever to see the doctor, um, then tell them to capture the pictures on the phone so that we can then sort of see what they look like. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, we've recently had a pronouncement from uh, NICE, uh, who produced the public health guidelines or treatment guidelines in England and certainly for the rest of the UK. And um, we have all agreed um, that the treatment is a simple antibiotic, one called doxycycline, 200 milligrams for three weeks. Um, you don't do blood tests for this stage of Lyme disease, you just get on and treat. So it's your own doctors uh, seeing it being a clinical diagnosis. The blood tests confuse things and, 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 and are not, not necessary. The key thing with this is that the, the drugs have to be taken for the whole three weeks. And the other thing is this particular medicine um, can react with the sun, and so people can come out with allergic reactions when they're on that particular blood test, that particular uh, antibiotic. Now, um, I'm sure those of you who are interested in Lyme disease and so on uh, will realise that it's not just about the rash. Um, if we've caught it at the early stages that I've just described, it's completely curative with antibiotics. The difficulty is that if it's not caught at that stage, it then becomes deep, goes deeper into the body. The symptoms are fairly vague and will appear after three months. Uh, often fairly vague symptoms like flu-like symptoms, uh, joint pains, uh, are getting a dead leg, um, not being able to walk properly. Um, that's when it's gone into the nervous system and affected um, the nerves. It can affect joints and give you uh, Lyme arthritis. Um, I diagnosed a, a new patient with Lyme arthritis uh, last week um, with, from a, a, croft, a local crofter who got his tick bite last summer, took it off with his fingernails, comes to see with his, it seems to me, with his hot soil and knee, um, uh, as I say, two weeks ago. And the blood test being positive. It can also affect uh, the heart and the conducting system, mainly the conducting system of the heart. There's also this difficult topic of late Lyme disease. This is where somebody gets the, they've got this, they've had this bit, they've been given um, intravenous antibiotic treatment, uh, the symptoms kind of go away with the antibiotics but then sort of seem to sort of relapse. Um, and so despite aggressive treatment with antibiotics and so on, uh, they still feel pretty rubbish um, for some time. And uh, that feeling of feeling generally feeling unwell can go on for sometimes two to three years, but eventually they do feel better. And again, what else can it be? I'm grateful to my colleague Stuart Smith and Vanessa who put me in touch with this lady. Um, this lady, uh, we were hearing about the FAST test this morning from Alan, which is very important, and strokes are much more likely than Bell's palsy. But Bell's palsy, remember the picture I showed you of the little child? can occur in any age group, um, adults and children, but it's more common 
uh, in older adults. Um, what happens is the tick must have been in this lady's hairline, uh, it then gets into the nerve and then causes this, um, this drooping, of the, drooping of the face. Now the, the, diff the difficulty with this is the vast majority of Bell's palsy is not caused by Lyme disease, but it's one of the things that needs to be considered and whether somebody who's got Bell's palsy has been exposed um, to ticks or not. And this is something that, again, we're trying to address in the local health service about people encouraging doctors and so on to think about the risks of Lyme disease and so on. Now, how can you teach this? Coming back to the basic first aid thing, uh, I want you to become familiar with twisters and cards yourself. Um, you are very welcome to use my videos that I'll just uh, make reference to in a minute. Um, and uh, point them to Forestry Commission uh, information on tick awareness. And also point people to the NHS uh, Scotland website on outdoor bugs and germs. The prevention advice, the current party line for Health Protection Scotland is that well, if we all stick to paths and avoid brushing through bracken then we'll be okay, we're less likely to pick up the ticks. They're more common in March and October. Ticks are already out. Uh, one of my sons uh, took his girlfriend to Arisade Beach uh, last week and got himself a tick. Um, so they are already about. Um, they're around all year, but they, they, they like the wet months of um, spring and all the uh, spring and, and, and uh, autumn. Tuck in long trousers, um, deep sprays. Um, are a method, but obviously they're, they're uh, uh, pesticide. Um, and I'm very clear that on balance of risks, as I was saying this morning, there's far more to be gained by outdoor activity and health and well-being than any risk of ticks or any risk of outdoor bugs and germs. And the, the, the actual risk from the tick uh, is relatively small. This is the stuff that I was talking about the Forestry Commission. So if you Google Forestry Commission Scotland tick, Ticked off campaign, that's a really good source. I'll allow you to write it down. Okay, so um, ticked off campaign by the Forestry Commission. Um, and I'm very happy for you to use this um, in training. This was a little idea that I had, um, which I've been to get some feedback in a later time, or if you guys can come up with some better. Um, it's a training tool, so um, that's uh, FEMO, which is obviously like plasticine that you put in the oven and then it bakes hard, which uh, children use for sort of modelling things. Um, I did this wee thing of put, putting poppy seeds and melon seeds uh, in FEMO and then using that as the method of then flicking them out and seeing whether I could get it to work or not. They, they do kind of pop out, but you might find that that simple little engaging tool, if you like, on a first aid course might or might not help you. Um, this is a, a tick removal video that I've done uh, for NHA Scotland. Uh, if you Google tick removal Douglas YouTube, uh, it should come up. Uh, I deliberately did it with NHS logos and I deliberately took out the branding, that's a tick card, but I deliberately put that, took out the branding for politically correct NHS Scotland. Um, so it's free to share, it's got NHS logos, um, you can put it on your company websites or whatever else or recommend it to people, but it kind of goes through and deliberately, I spent a lot of time with a friend editing it down to something like three minutes um, to try and make sure that people would actually look at it uh, in, in the short time frames that we have on, on phones and so on. So the summary slide, um, I want you to understand the ecology um, what I'm keen for you to do is to teach on your courses a generational shift in understanding. So the general public out there, I'm really surprised every time I see a patient with this sort of thing, how did you take the tick off? They all, and they all still taking them off with, with fingers and tweezers and goodness knows what. I think the solution to this is to get the education down to school level, to primary school, nursery school level. So therefore the stuff that you were talking about this morning about first aid courses for children, I think we need to kind of embed that sort of stuff in that. Um, we can live safely with the ticks if we just get them off quickly, by the correct method, and then no big deal, no problem. We can deal with the bacteria bacteria clinically if we get early diagnosis and early treatment. The early treatment is curative, no more problems. What's coming down the track um, in Europe, so tick problems and Lyme disease are a problem all across the Northern Hemisphere, so across uh, America and across Canada, also in Europe, particularly in Northern Europe. Swedes have got a big problem with it. 
The Dutch have got a big problem with it. Um, and in Europe, oh, sorry, in Europe, hmm, goodness me, sorry, but it's sorry, welcome back to Chicago. Oh, right, sorry. Um, so at the moment, um, I'll start talking about this slide in a second, but in Europe, uh, they've got a problem with tick-borne encephalitis, and that's, instead of being a bacteria, it's a virus, and you can't treat the, there isn't anything to treat the virus with. So we haven't got it yet, but it's perfectly possible that by, you know, world transmission of bacteria and viruses and so on, we might end up with tick-borne encephalitis. In this country, in Scotland, we've certainly got a problem with, uh, there's a condition called lumping ill. Uh, it's a problem which affects sheep. And there have been a few, and I'm talking about a handful of patients over, over decades, about 12 patients recorded in Scotland over, over about sort of 30 to 40 years. Um, it is possible it can transmit to humans, um, but that at the moment is our only virus version of this. Um, so I think if we get, if we get the tick removal right, um, then there's, there's less of a problem. So in terms of how common is this, um, I did this slide um, for a conference on Lyme disease I was talking about in Edinburgh just a few weeks ago. This is the number of, in my practice, last year, per thousand patients, the number of cases of erythema migrans, that's that, as you see, that far there. Uh, the number of cases of Bell's palsy is that. The number of cases of people with positive blood tests is that. But when you compare it with, okay, we're thinking about rashes that might have health implications, so melanoma, the moles that have gone wrong and are cancerous, that's that. Um, rodent ulcers, the things on people's faces, um, that's that. We were talking earlier on about strokes. That's the number of strokes, new episodes of stroke in my practice, the same population. The number of people we were talking earlier on about acute coronary syndrome. That's the number of patients with acute coronary syndrome, the same as the number of erythema migrans. Breast cancer and prostate cancer for per thousand patients in my practice last year, much less. So we spent a lot of time worrying about breast cancer, bowel cancer, strokes, coronary syndromes, and so on. But you know, this is important. Okay, this is my practice where we've got a problem. You'll get different numbers in a, practice, in a, in a city practice in the centre of Edinburgh. Um, but people from Edinburgh do go to the Highlands and do come back with ticks and do present to their own doctors with, with, with lashes and so on. So I think it is an important topic. So there's a sort of two to three year life cycle of the tick. Um, it starts off at the egg stage, obviously. Um, and then first thing that hatches out is the larva stage, um, when the tick has got six legs at that point. Uh, the larva then gets its first blood meal, and the first blood meal is likely to be from a ground living um, uh, a bull or a grouse or something like that. And having got its, its first blood meal, the lymph then uh, grows an early pair of legs, and it's now got eight legs, and it becomes a so called questing nymph. And the questing nymph uh, then goes seek, seek, seeking, seeking its second blood meal, and it might get that from a deer or a dog um, or a human. And this is really when. Uh, this is when the disease transmission is, is quite likely to have occurred. The nymph then goes on uh, to develop into the adult stage, uh, and you get a male and a female adult tick, uh, and then it goes on to its third blood meal, and then we go around the loop again over two to three years. The reason why this is important is because um, the, life, the, the stage at which a tick could be a problem, so it's unlikely at the larva stage, the very tiny, tiny ones, that it's going to be a problem. But it's highly likely at the questing nymph stage, which is the next stage up, and that's scaled up onto a fingernail, that it is going to be a problem. <coughs> the first point to say in all this is the vast majority of ticks don't carry Borrelia, they don't carry the bacteria. So you can be, in the first aid sense, completely reassuring that even if you've been bitten by a tick, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get Lyme disease. It's, 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 um, because only a small percentage actually carry the bacteria. 